please welcome to the podium Professor Marcy Morgan. She's Professor of African and African American Studies and Director of the Hip Hop Archive here. Thank you. It's a pleasure to introduce Harry Allen, who along with Donna Lisa Fisher and John Jennings <clears throat> are the 2016-17 NAS Fellows at the Hip Hop Archive and Du Bois Institute. To say that Harry Allen is a journalist is a major understatement. He is, as he states, also an activist and a media assassin. It was the late 1980s when he first appeared on numerous public enemy recordings and accepted the position as director of enemy relations. <laughs> Harry Allen spoke to, or rather confronted the media to correct misconceptions about public enemies' uncompromising politics, occasionally adding commentary to some public enemy tracks. Though his career did not begin with the 1988 track, Don't Believe the Hype, his skill, analysis, and willingness to expose the mainstream media was significant. It laid the groundwork for activism and understanding of both the need to stand up for political and socially conscious hip hop, and, but also how to do it resolute, resolutely and how to inscribe across as many platforms and mediums as possible, don't believe the hype. Throughout his career, Harry Allen has written extensively about race, politics, and culture in his blog, Media Assassin, as well as for publications such as Vibe, The Source, Village Voice, and more. He is the host and producer of the weekly radio show, Nonfiction, on WBAI in New York, 99.5, and he serves as advisor to the Archives of African American Music and Culture at Indiana University. In addition to the projects he's talking about, project he's talking about today, he's also writing a book about architectural design and computer and video games, and he's working on a project called Kalabi Yao spaces, or um, its objective is curating work by master artists in order to apply the designs of wild style writing to very limited high-end homewares. Now, in 1994, Public Enemy's Music in Our Message features a voicemail message skit entitled Harry Allen's Interactive Superhighway Phone Call to Chuck D. He was an early proponent of the internet, creating an online presence for Public Enemy in 1991, publishing the webzine rap.com and leading a panel discussion on music and the internet with Chuck D and Adam Curry during the 1994 New Music Seminar. He stated on his radio show, quote, anyone can be on the internet, and now anyone is on the internet. In a 1995 Wired Magazine interview, Harry Allen spoke about hip hop in relation to technology. He said that African Americans are alienated from technology is a myth. There is far more evidence showing quite the opposite. When useful technology is not, is not kept from us by white people who practice racism, or when it is not used to oppress us, we usually find energetic ways to get a maximum, to get a new maximum out of it. Additionally, I say that the power of hip hop lies in its ability to radically combine sounds, imagery, text, and other media within its forms. <clears throat> and I want to read a, a, a passage from his interactive superhighway phone call to Chuck D. And, and remember, this is 1994 when he says, the technology is changing. The way people use information is changing, how they get information, all these options available to you. The music industry is showing up. They're making sure they're ahead of the te technological and legal curve so, that the, so by the time anyone in the general public, whether it be Q-Tip, yourself, Bruce Springsteen, George Michael, knows what's going on and sees how the whole pre process is going towards decentralization. That is to say, you don't have mon monopolies on us anymore because the equipment to do it will be available to anybody, just the same way that the equipment to make a hip hop record is available to anybody and a hit can come from any direction. 
I think what the music company is trying to do is to make sure that legally and financially and in terms of information that they own or are ahead of the curve so that by the time everyone else catches on, they will already own enough to make sure you still have to play their game. Of course, a lot of technology you read about doesn't exist yet. It is in crude form, but much of it is starting to, what are we talking about ultimately, is a shift in the way this music is distributed. This is as important as contracts, plaque power, among everything else. And that's 1994 on a public enemy recording, spreading the news to the hip hop community urgently and in, in many respects foreseeing the future. He's still the activist, he's still the journalist, still the media assassin, still director of enemy relations, still about love, growth, and power, and hip hop. I introduce you to Harry Allen, the hypertext, analyzing the data and assembly of hip hop musical recordings for narrative purposes. Thank you. In his, 19, in his 1963 book, Blues People, Amiri Baraka states that the disastrous mid-millennium clashes between Europe and the rest of the world, especially Africa, were more than jarring cultural encounters. As we will no doubt see in Dr. Gates' upcoming PBS special, Africa's Great Civilizations, these were violent collisions of worldviews and of entire holistic frameworks, visions of the universe so opposing as to render each other exotic. Then to make his point come home, Baraka says this, a Byzantine man could not understand the existence of a structure like the Empire State Building that was not erected to praise Jehovah. I have a similar limitation or insight from the moment I received the email telling me I'd been invited to be a part of the Nasir Jones Fellowship Program at the Hutchins Center at Harvard University. I've seen it and everything that has followed as a sign of God's beneficence. I remain thankful to him for his goodness to me. Of course, and this is true, that day, I then looked closely at the email and noticed it was dated April 1st, or April Fool's Day. <laughs> so for the next couple of hours, I wondered if I'd really gotten in to the fellowship or if someone was playing a kind of prank on me. My thanks to the larger Harvard community for this opportunity. My thanks to my fellows at the Hutchins Center, past and present, too many to name but not to remember, for their brilliance, respect, and kindnesses. My thanks to Abby Wolf, Krishna Kali Lewis, and their amazing army at the Hutchins Center who do so much to keep us comfortable, equipped, and productive. My thanks to Dr. Marcelina Morgan, not just for that very warm introduction, but mostly for believing that there should be a scholarly entity for hip hop culture, that it should be at Harvard University, and that she should begin it. My thanks to Dr. Henry Louis Gates Jr. for his dreams about the massively parallel interconnectedness of global black culture and his unwillingness to, make, to wake from those dreams, but most of all for doing the work required to realize them until all see his visions as a given fact. Three more people I wanna thank. DJ Prince Paul slapped hip hop awake via Stetsasonic, then shocked it through De La Soul, then curdled its noggin via music under his own name he is a genius and a giant. I'm so honored he agreed to work on the hypertext with me, Prince Paul. <laughs> My sister-in-law, Wilma, is here. Back in September, she and her husband, Lawrence, drove 15 hours round trip to get me up to Harvard. I'm so happy she's attending, and if you enjoy any point of this talk, thank her. And
and even more so, of course, my lovely wife, Zakia, the ultimate ride-or-die chick. <laughs> Z, you're my best friend and the greatest woman I've ever known. And most of all, thank you all for being here, because um, if you weren't, I'd be talking to myself. <laughs> which I found is really not such a bad thing after all. <laughs> so as Ella Fitzgerald uh, silkily said, let's begin. So at what are we looking here? In his 2013 monograph, Things Come Apart, photographer Todd McLellan treats us to pictures of small, medium, and large objects that he has meticulously disassembled, then photographed with immaculate detail. Some he captures in a seemingly haphazard way. For example, this vintage hand-powered lawnmower at which you've been gazing. Others, though, are depicted in an almost grid-like fashion with every single nut, bolt, washer, lever, and other part at ready, like miniature soldiers, like the 1,465 miniature soldiers that make up this 1960s Argos accordion. The thrilling part about disassembling an object itself, even before the photography, says McClellan, is the opportunity to understand the manufacturer's challenge. I gain a better understanding of how the item works and in turn, a greater respect for it. iFixit.com's Kyle Weens wrote an essay about the ethos of repairing household appliances as opposed to throwing them out. It appears in McClellan's book. He says, the process of disassembling products requires an assimilation of the minds of the creators. We glean wisdom from understanding their workings. To disassemble is to learn. So why am I talking about this? Because these practitioners have identified a retrospective, deconstructive process, one based in literally taking past artifacts carefully apart as the key to their comprehension of those objects. That's their investigatory mode. Carefully breaking down common objects helps them to understand those products creators' goals and to literally see these works in new ways. I could perhaps find no better statement by analogy of the core objectives and methods of our project, the hypertext. So over the next uh, several minutes, I'm going to tell you about my project. I'm going to talk about some of its theoretical underpinnings and about the three-step process of producing it. I'm going to play some video that I expect will demonstrate the kind of insights we're seeking. I'm going to play some audio that we've recorded as part of our production process, about 20 minutes worth. And then there's one more thing I may talk about at the end. So as Slick Rick would say, here we go. The Hypertext is our planned podcast series. It analyzes classic hip hop recordings, both lyrically and instrumentally, doing so at the multi-track level. That is, its objective is to look closely at every part and aspect of a hip hop record to see how and why it works as a musical system. It does this by at least three processes. One, reviewing a record's original studio multi-track recordings. I'll explain what multi-track recordings are in a moment for those who don't know. Conducting interviews with the composition's original creators, producers, MCs, DJs, etc., as well as by three, hosting conversations with diverse cultural experts and thoughtful commentators for their insights on that given recording or on matters related to it. Some history. The earliest appearance of the term hypertext is in a 1965 Association for Computing Machinery conference paper authored by IT pioneer Ted Nelson. Today, however, the best known hypertext is without question the internet's World Wide Web. On its website, the World Wide Web Consortium defines a hypertext as, quote, text which contains links to other texts, end quote. It's a great definition. <laughs> Martin, in a semiotic sense, says the term hypertext designates, quote, literary texts which allude, derive from, or relate to an earlier work, or hypotext. These ideas of allusion, 
derivation and or relating to an earlier work are dominant ones in my understanding of hip hop. They're concepts that digital sampling makes blatant as artists sonically copy fragments from previously recorded pieces of sound, then weld those fragments into new settings. They're also built into the way hip hop lyrics are written as rappers frequently cite other texts in order to build a new written script. Putting it, putting it in terms of the music, the record or lyric that does the sampling is the hypertext. The record or lyric that gets sampled is the hypotext. I've chosen this word hypertext then as signifying a particular reading of hip hop. Said another way, I refer to hip hop in whole as the hypertext, the way many entities refer to the internet as the cloud. That is, hip hop is made up consciously and often conspicuously from small pieces of other stuff. This is my dominant reading of it. And even hip hop's tools are minute and incisive. A DJ's needle shown here, cutting and scratching a record, for example, is in contact with only about 10 square microns of the disc at any given moment, a surface area equal to less than a quarter that of a human blood cell. This may be the most tentative touch of any instrumentalist in any field, genre, or culture. Because of this discrete and fragmentary approach to sound making, it can be hard for many listeners to detect or decipher many of the references a given work may present. The hypertext job, among others then, is to map these nodes and to explain why they're there. So let's talk about the work. My fellowship proposal was to use the time here at Harvard to create a work, to A, create a working process for producing the podcast, and B, to produce two demos of the concept. Two records we've focused on for our two demos are Pep Love's Freak Rock from his 2012 Hieroglyphics Imperium album, Rigmarole, and produced by Unjust, and Juggernaut's Crazy Eights from their 2006 Matic Entertainment album, Use Your Confusion, and produced by J-Zone. For the purposes of this presentation, my focus will be exclusively on the former record by Pep Love. However, in the most general way, the process of creating the two demos has been almost exactly the same. It begins by identifying the record to put through the hypertext process. While we've stated our objective as examining classic hip hop records, I've applied that term to mean perhaps recursively records about which I'm curious and in whose story I'm interested. As a journalist, I've always, been, I've always believed in being led by my own curiosity and working to satisfy it. I believe one always does one's best work when they labor this way. At this stage, classic hip hop records also means independently released and or produced recordings. As we have not yet struck a relationship for this kind of project with a major distributor such as Universal Music. Major labels and distributors are far more risk aversive when it comes to their archives uh, as you might expect. They're hesitant to turn over copies of their master recordings for new uses. These objects form huge profit centers for these companies. But we're working at getting access and we remain expectant. So first we identify a record to process. Then we reach out to an artist, producer, or label owner. When it comes to independent recordings, these are often the same person. We tell them about what we're doing and why. Grasping the concept is typically the most straightforward part of this for these artists. They get the curiosity others have about their work and they also understand the usefulness of such a project to that work. One artist compared what we are doing to making liner notes, which have for the most part disappeared in popular music, but were traditionally written by experts telling listeners what was important about a new record. And in all, I've had great positive conversations with these artists and creators about this aspect of the task. As part of that conversation, we then ask the artists if they will send us copies of the multi-track recordings that form the foundation of the record. The multi-tracks are the record in record, so to speak. 
by way of explanation, many people do not know that modern musical recordings are made in layers called tracks. Until around the turn of the millennium or so, this was done on machines like this eight track half inch tape machine. Notice that it has 16 tracks as denoted by the VU meters in front, eight stereo tracks with two channels each for 16 total tracks. Or machines like this one, which is two two inch tape 24 track machines electronically linked to create 48 tracks or 24 stereo channels. Technology like this was ultimately made obsolete by computers and by digital software like Pro Tools. With a copy of Pro Tools, a producer is working with virtual interfaces that are based on the original look and feel of the analog multi-track recorder and or studio mixing board setup. But his or her powers are otherwise radically increased in terms of the number of elements they can record and the control they have over them. Many other aspects of, the recording multi, of recording multi-tracks often say the same, however, whether doing so digitally or analogically. Usually rhythmic elements, such as bass and drums, are recorded first, one at a time, on separate tracks. Then other parts, horns, keyboards, strings, etc., are recorded subsequently, or on top of the rhythmic elements, each in their own tracks, and in time with earlier ones, generally up to, again, 24 different elements, in two channel stereo for a total again of 48 tracks. Then once this is done, the instrumental track is finished and the vocalist will then record their part or parts. This is also the case in hip hop as well as in instances where the vocal is sung. Of course, these can be done and often are in other orders or sequences. And as well, these performances can be done in different places or at different times in certain genres performers on the same recording will often never meet each other. So think of the multi-track recording then like a sandwich where each layer of food one puts on it adds to the composite taste of the whole. Or think of it like the layers in the Earth's sedimentation. As an archeologist digs through the Earth's sedimentary layers, she uncovers a narrative of the planet's history in time. And in a way, records are sedimentary. Looking deeply into historic sound recordings tells us about the history, technology, and customs of an era, much as looking at clay shards also do. An excellent example uh, in practice of what I'm describing can be seen in this four and a half minute YouTube video. It features Harry Winger, VP of a and for Universal Music Enterprises, and Questlove, Amir Questlove Thompson, co-founder and percussionist for The Roots. Here, they listen to various sections of the title song from Marvin Gaye's pinnacle effort, 1971's What's Going On. Note how, as they do, the spirit of discovery and learning is fragrant in the air. So right before the 30th anniversary of the What's Going On album, I'm in the tape vault looking for anything that remotely resembles the words, what's going on, what's happening, brother, right on, flying high, I'm going down the track list. I'd be thinking, there's gotta be sessions, there's gotta be outtakes. And then there's a stack of tapes, and they all have the songs in sequence, and they're on two inch tape, which is a multi-track tape, where you can separate the instruments, make a mix, a stereo, it was all right. And you play it, then you have that another holy smokes moment of, I can hear it, I can reimagine it, I can see it, you know? You want to just tell me what, bring things in out, or you want to? Yeah, yeah. Actually, I want to hear the rhythm tracks first. Yeah. It's weird to hear this in its raw stage because, right. you know, I've always known this to be the conga mix was so big with the uh, reverb mm -hmm. and it just made it sound, I always felt like the song was performed in some sort of cathedral only because the, the, the two of the conga track uh, always had a big mm -hmm. giant uh, reverb. Mm -hmm. It's so weird just to hear it in its natural closed in state. So what we hear is So I, I can hear the squeaking 
of the kick pedal. So he's obviously standing at a drum set doing this. So there's two drum sets. What's so cool about it is that this, this is like one of the most undefined drum songs <laughs> of soul music. Like there's, I don't think of drums when I think of what's going on. I think of the conga. I always felt like it was a ritual syncopated. Right. It's got a percussive thrust. Right. right. So and then the great Jamerson. James Jamerson on bass. Right. I always wondered though, why didn't they just bring the like it could have been a whole different song. Had the drums just been the, the force of it, but I guess that would have taken away from it. Yeah, I think Marvin was pretty specific. He didn't want a Motown drum. <laughs> this, is probably, this is probably the biggest surprise of them all. Right. The fact that an acoustic guitar was used. Like, right. In your experience, have you had many acoustic guitars? I, I can't think of one. Right. It's a clean amp. I, I almost think he was going direct. They usually did. Guitar play, the guitar players usually went direct. Because on those original records, there's three guitar players, and they're all on one tra channel. Because they, they all were responsible for their own levels going to one. Oh, into one channel. Right, one channel, and that channel went di into the board. Who's on piano? Marvin. Marvin. Parts are broken up. This is a whole nother song. <laughs> right. Yeah, when you when you pair up different things, you have Marvin with the guitar, Marvin with the bass, it's a different different feel. As Questlove says in words, photographer Todd McLellan uh, and my producer DJ Prince Paul would affirm, when all the parts are broken up, this is a whole nother song. Hearing those recordings is where the analyzing the data and assembly of hip hop musical recordings in my colloquium co a subtitle comes in. Paul and I have already found that in getting those multi-tracks from artists, usually as individual stems or as Pro Tools sessions and analyzing their content and how they were put together, one learns so much about how producers and artists who made them work and think. And also being able to hear the work, not as a composite, but in parts, creates new opportunities for thinking about it. Surprise, Edgar. <laughs> I gotta get you for that. <laughs> you can't. This is my colloquium. What can you do? <laughs> Co Hutchins Fellow and Dr. Ingrid T. Monson, um, the Quincy Jones Professor of African American Music here at Harvard, calls this activity perceptual agency. She notes that in her jazz history courses, quote, I teach my students to listen from the bottom of the band up. In other words, I ask them to focus their listening first on the bass line, then on the ride cymbal of the drum set, and then on piano comping patterns, the typical elements that go into establishing the rhythmic feel or groove of the piece. Among other benefits, says uh, Monson, quote, this practice of shifting the focus of attention enriches the listening experience for audiences and consumers of recordings, end quote. By mechanically isolating multitracks, Prince Paul and I are trying to compel this kind of intuitive process. We're at least attempting to make opportunities to hear this manner of artistic discovery more accessible. 
So based on what we hear in the multitrack, the next step is to formulate lines of inquiry for the artists and others, to write questions by which the be to best pursue those lines, as well as to create a list of specific persons with whom to speak and that will record. Uh, of course, I won't go into all the questions or kinds of questions now. Um, suffice it to say that they are wide ranging, looking at everything from early influences to later production methods. This is the narrative purposes part of our research and my subtitle. What we're attempting to do is to figure out how to tell a story about this work of art and the people involved in making it. Let me put it this way. I have an operating principle that all great art originates in some form of disappointment. Of course, the very first form of this is that represented by the world, the one in which the art piece does not exist and for which creating the work itself is compensatory. However, more, what one finds is that artists tend to create out of discontent and unease. Rarely, as it turns out, will one hear an artist say, one day I was feeling great, so I went home and made this. It is the stone in the shoe, the thing that won't stop being a problem that mostly gets creative people making things, especially when those things are great and not trivial. In discussing the making of Freak Rock with Pep Love, it became clear that two issues had driven the work. One, Pep's disdain for the sidelined, minimized role that the hip hop disc jockey had come to play in hip hop culture. Put another way, as I like to ask, who is Jay-Z's DJ? And two, the disillusion of an important foundational relationship, the dissolution of an important foundational relationship, that of Jay, Jay, Jay Biz Suarez, his childhood friend and first DJ. Finding these narrative threads, optimally developing them and understanding how to keep doing so from podcast to podcast to podcast has been a key challenge of our work. Uh, the next, and I guess you could say final key step in the process, is identifying expert commentators to talk about the recordings and to add their voices to our mix. Particularly, I was primarily, but not only, interested in speaking to musicologists, journalists, and artists who could talk about hip hop in creative terms. Our team was not hard to build, though, starting with my own connections, for example, the great New York City-based ethnomusicologist Joe Schloss, author of Making Beats, led me to Wayne Marshall, a professor here, and a professor here. Say hi, Wayne, thank you. <laughs> Both at Harvard and the Berklee College of Music. Another musicologist uh, colleague could not participate, but pointed me to Lauren Kachikawa at the University of Oregon and Kyle Adams at Indiana University. Martin Connor was a theoretician with whom I'd wanted to work for a while. Good to see you here, Martin. On the other hand, Saeed's books on hip hop production have become standards. With Amanda Sewell of Interlochen Public Radio, independent rapper and playwright Justin, Baba Brinkman, hip hop DX video strategist and brand ambassador Justin Hunt, hip hop investigator and writer Mal Mal Maloud Sadiq, and last but not least, Dilated People's lead vocalist Raka Iris Science. I, helped, I felt I had a great lineup. Of course, another inexhaustible team member was Harvard's astounding Widener Library. It connected me to the research of these scholars and to many others. Indeed, it felt impossible to even scratch Widener's surface. So capacious are the library's holdings. And here also, I also have to thank Harvard's student radio program, a station, WHRB, and Aditya Raghuram, its chief studio engineer who oversaw almost all my interviews. I also thank all the other studios and engineers that made speaking to and recording these expert commentators possible. Everyone I've mentioned here came through, as did others, and almost everyone I asked participated both generously and convivially. What we've been left with is an embarrassment of riches in terms of commentary, insight, and analysis uh, from these recordings. These are materials through which we still need to sort and we need to edit and format. 
and who's in some and whose use in some places we, we may even need to rethink. So before I close, I want to thank Jim Boyd and Norcius Noel of our AV department for keeping me seen, heard, and in some moments from jumping out of a window. Um, I want to thank Deirdre, uh, my sound person whose job is just now really beginning. I'm going to play about 20 minutes of audio for you. Again, these are only from one of the two podcast demos on which we're, we're working. The one about Pep Love's Freak Rock from his 2012 hieroglyphics album, Rigmarole. These are not finished pieces, nor will they necess be necessarily be part of the final podcast. I'm playing them now to give you a sense of what, we're, what we've been doing with Harvard's money and where we might be... <laughs> and where we might be heading, and the approach with which we're working. The first playback is a mock-up of how the podcast might start. Uh, there, we're testing an arrangement, music, vocals, and storytelling. Again, this is not final. How, however, the, the one thing that we're pretty sure may be done is our eight-second theme song, which you'll hear. Uh, this first piece is about three and a half minutes long. Then I'll play a piece of audio where Pep Love thoughtfully speaks to the question, what is hip hop's purpose? This is about two minutes long. Then in the next vocal and music piece, Unjust, Pep Love's producer on Freak Rock, talks about Pep's approach to music making, then takes us through the elements he created to make the track Freak Rock. This segment is seven minutes long. Then I'm going to play Freak Rock, Pep Love's pain to the hip hop DJ in this case, DJ Plattern, and to the natural orbit by which an MC encircles the DJ. You'll get to hear unjust audio elements in their final setting. You'll also hear the awesomely isometric rhythmic approach and lyrical audacity of Pep Love and the way he treats those elements. Uh, and finally, so you don't have to read sheets of paper, we created a lyric video, so you can just look up at the screen, and um, this will be just under four minutes. And then we'll see if we have time for anything else. Like a kid with his favorite toy, there's no real utilitarian purpose for a toy, but it's something that a kid will really get a lot of enjoyment out of. But I think it's deeper than that with hip hop. There is a purpose. It brings people together. It, um, it makes people see beyond their, their physical circumstances with, into their imagination and what things can possibly be. And for me... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, yes, that was out of order. I meant this one. Before you yeah. Okay. yeah. Forgive me, that was just a bit out of order. Thank you. So just say that. Just. Are we on? So just say that. Just, hi, this is. Um, I don't even know what your government name is, Pat. <laughs> it's Paulo Peacock. Say it again Paulo Peacock. That's a, name with, that's a name with distinction, sir. The Hypertext. Greetings, I'm Harry Allen on behalf of DJ Prince Paul and I. Welcome to The Hypertext, the podcast where we look at how classic hip hop records were made. On today's edition of The Hypertext, we'll be talking about a hieroglyphic stalwart, Pep Love, Based in Oakland, California, Hyro is one of hip hop's most important collectives. They're well known not only in the Bay Area, but around the world. Fans love them for their earthy studio production, thoughtfully spun rhymes and legendary third eye logo, but also for their independence and community spirit. Since 2001, Pep Love has released five albums under his own name on the Hieroglyphics Imperium label. His most recent, 2012's Rigmarole, features the recording that we'll be analyzing on this edition of the Hypertext. Produced by Unjust, it's the eighth track on that work, a three minute and 47 second piece called Freak Rock. But to tell the story of Freak Rock, we should first tell the story of Pep Love, the artist behind the record. P, E, P are actually my initials, including my middle, my middle initial, Paulo Emil Peacock. That's right, Paulo Emil Peacock, or P, E, P, as in Pep Love. 
He was born July 17, 1974, in Jackson, Mississippi, to Mr. and Mrs. Wazir and Elaine Peacock. In Jackson, his dad was a civil rights activist employed on the voter registration front, and his mom was a student working on her master's degree. Talking to Pip about his early life, it's clear that Jackson, Mississippi holds a very, very important part of that memory. It was a time in my life where, you know, life just seemed more like the quaint American version of, you know, family life, house, we had a dog, and my parents were together. We had a garden and lightning bugs. Certain times of the year, when it gets dark, you could catch one in a jar and they would stick, they would light up. And um, dragonflies, I saw a dragonfly in California just a couple of weeks ago and it's something I never would see. You never see dragonflies here. It's too dry here, I don't, I don't think they like it. Um, there's a lot of different insects that you would see down there, mosquitoes. There's nowhere near the mosquitoes in California that they were in, in Mississippi. Going to the creek, in the creek, you know, there's that element of danger too. There was like water moccasins, which are super poisonous, you know, venomous snake, but they're also extremely timid and afraid of people. So they, you know, they'll go the other way, but if they bite you, you're in trouble. I saw a couple of them, gosh. I'm like, why did we come here when these big poisonous snakes are, are around? But yeah, it was, it was that, Mississippi. It's a lot of outdoors type stuff. That's what I remember in those years of my life. Like a kid with his favorite toy. There's no real utilitarian purpose for a toy, but it's something that a kid will really get a lot of enjoyment out of. But I think it's deeper than that with hip hop. There is a purpose. It brings people together. It, um, it makes people see beyond their, their physical circumstances with, into their imagination and what things can possibly be. And for me, one of the reasons why it fascinates me is because I feel like I can wield this same power with words. When it touches the music and then when it touches the person's heart when it touches my own heart. When I'm rhyming or when I'm recording or when I'm performing or rehearsing or whatever and it is good to me, you know, I, I get a, it's a rush. Um, yeah, it's like a, it's a rush. And it's a, it's a rush that I feel like when I feel other people feel too. It connects us, a flower in bloom is blossoming, it spreads its seed, but it's also, it's blooming just to be beautiful and to have a, a lovely scent. And it brings bees and the bees spread the pollen. It's like that kind of thing. But the bloom itself seems like almost unnecessary, the beautiful colors and why? I don't know why. I don't know if it, if it serves a purpose, but somehow it helps to, to spread the seed, the word, and for me, the feeling of being connected to the music and feeling like I'm riding the wave of uh, excellence, like this, I do this and I do this well, is like being, for me, it's like being that, that flower where you're blooming just to bloom, but there's a purpose being served that's going on after me. Pep is very much a creature of the vibe, meaning that he takes time to get in the right place to make a quality product. It's not a linear process. It's very much um, emotive. It's very much, um, let's make some music and see where this energy takes us. I had no intention of making a DJ anthem, I'll put it that way, but it was important for the music that I made to be anthematic, um, meaning for it to have urgency and power. And, and I did a lot of that by where I got my samples from. 
which in addition to vinyl and traditional places, um, I got a lot of inspiration and source from uh, 60s, 70s, and 80s television and movies. In those old shows, the music was almost like a, a cast member, like an actor in the film, and it always really played a big role in telling the story. So I really find using that music to just convey a, a little more urgency and a stronger emotion than a lot of sounds that are used now. You know, there's a few sounds in there, two in particular, that I took from Doctor Who, from the Doctor Who opening. It's the part that goes, So that part, the do do do, that was one part of it. The and then there's another part. Uh, that part was, I think, most noticeably <laughs> from Doctor Who. That, yeah, right here. I'll play it one more time. Like that's a great sound. Where are you going to get? I mean, you can recreate that sound. With, uh, uh, with any modern keyboard, but it probably wouldn't be the same. It wouldn't have the same context. With this beat, as with many, I started with the drums. Then I will start to, you know, assemble pieces and see how the, these little accents can be pitched and tuned and filtered to accentuate one another to where they melt into one thing. So I believe on this one, I uh, started with this guitar uh, loop, which is actually not a loop, it's one note that I was playing repeatedly uh, on quarter notes, or I'm sorry, on, uh, on 16th notes. So I laid that down to kind of establish again a, a rhythmic bass line for the piece. And then you, I started adding stabs, like power stabs, um, to just give it some structure. So that would be something like. you've gone through a couple of those loops, like I said, you, you want to make it seem like it's not repetitive, like it's a composition. So to accentuate the lyrics and accentuate the start of the actual narrative of the song, I strip it back down to just that guidance part, just the, just the little, just the little uh, the guitar string. And that, that allows, uh, you know, Pep in this case, or the MC to kind of start the story off uh, and get the listener uh, involved and, and, and captured. Um, there's a sound that I use, the uh, Korg Micro, which is a great all-purpose, a, a small synthesizer that has served me quite well. And there's the sound uh, that you can hear, it's like a and it kind of trails off a little bit, like that's that's the sound that I use. I think it's right here. Let me let me try and play it. Oh, not exactly. Coming up. That's it right there. The uh, this one. So that came from, from my chord micro. Um, I put the bass line in last to try to really accentuate the low of the already existing highs and mids of the, of the composition. Um, and this bass line I got also from the chord micro. Uh, I think that's why I bought it, because I did some research and uh, everything I had found said that you know the bass lines on it were, were uh, stellar. And, uh, it is still the main thing I use for bass. You don't just play along 
you know, like, bop, bop, beep, bop, boop, bop. You, you know, you kind of have to, it should be a little organically maybe off a little bit um, and should be conspicuously missing in parts too to make you, kind of to make you miss it. So let me go ahead and, and play that soloed out and you'll see what I'm talking about. So, yeah, there's just a little bit of, of kind of human error in a bass line that kind of has to be there. It can't, I mean, for me anyway, and what I like to put my name on, it can't, it, the whole thing has to sound like a person did it. Like, I don't like quantizing things, if I can help it. I don't like when things sound like you made it in a computer program. Like, I want my drums to sound like a drummer played the drums. I want my bass line to sound like somebody's playing the bass. I don't want it to sound like a, like a freaking, you know, a computer. Okay. That was me. <laughs> Great, Harry. Oops. Okay. Let's try that again. Record and replay. We having fun a little, fucking with the fundamentals. Spit puns and riddles. Fat love's gonna get you. We do the ritual, like keep it original. My audio, digital, visual, will get you in the mood. Where my jigger jiggers at? It's your trigger finger cats. Murder the wax and hit a with a wicked scratch. My friction fractures, batches of victims that I'm trying to kick a rap and sound like cooking crap. Home from the clone, get thrown overthrown. And we going home with a double X chromosome. You do a show from your iPod. I can rock a show to make the people say, oh my God. You 
admit that I gotta get this money, but I'm just trying to get free. I rock wet beats, I got techniques, 1200 and back. You rappers is a fresh beast. We the best, many better than the rest, please. To that and observe, the pop with the Red Sea. It might get messy, but the needle to the record and my mic testing hot like the jet stream. We got one, two, double, zero techniques. Every time I get up on the beat. That's my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take your questions, comments, suggestions, or complaints. I've been asked to. No? Oh, groovy. Excellent. So you are going to get me back. Drats. <laughs> First of all, I think this is amazing. I just think That's very kind. And, uh, you know, just the whole idea of taking, this is like musical analysis for the 21st century, and you're showing us how to do it. Um, Could you put the mic just a bit closer to you? And, Thank you. you know, I, th I think that's a, a beautiful thing. And um, I want to ask you, wh what pieces are next? And, <laughs> and, why, and I'm interested in podcast as the for format for distribution, how you decided on that. And I know, and I, then I have a geeky part to this question. Sure. I know how much time it takes to, to do this, to do this breaking it apart. Well. doing the interviews to get people to talk about it, um, I think is really, really important. And the geek part of my question is, how did you get the text to align to the beat coming Thank in? you. That part's easy. Um, <coughs> we have a, um, <coughs> a, a very talented lyric a video maker who I got in contact with, who I worked very closely with. I mean, he, he did most of that on his own, but we worked on certain details, you know, the images and things like that that we wanted, and um, he did a, an amazing, amazing to quote Donald Trump, amazing job. Um, in terms of the time, I realized very early in this process, talking to Prince Paul, that uh, we might be able to make three or four of these a year, which, and I don't even know if the economics make any sense. I'm so thankful that we had the ability to come here to Harvard and kind of work this out. Um, I, I was finding myself thinking just the other day, is this something that might work better as a commercial product or as an institutional product, hint, hint. Um, and so um, I, I'm just not sure because it is very labor intensive to kind of um, not only, and, and, and we're still dealing on the level of, of dealing with independent artists. And the reason we went to independent artists is because they have their materials and they own them and they're not fussy. Well, they are fussy, but they're not crazy about what's this for, we need a license uh, written out, da 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 da, dates, uh, where are the tapes, it, it's a lot less complicated. Um, and so uh, that, that's something we're really taking day by day, I think, as we go through the process of just of, of having the opportunity to kind of just work through it and see what will it take. That was one of the things I wanted to get done here as well as making the two demos, to come through with a, a process for producing them and see if it made sense, if this was actually something that could work, you know, certainly on a consistent basis. If, if this were something that we were doing, let's say, on a weekly basis, um, I'm, I don't know how it would get done without massive teams of people that might just defy any reasonable economics of, of doing something like this. And, you know, as they say, um, when you see something that doesn't exist, inevitably, if you try and bring it into existence, you're going to find out why it hasn't existed so far. Um, but I, I thank you for your, for your kind words. I don't know if I answered all of your, your questions, Ingrid. I want to say um, one more thing. I think you could get those of us who teach courses in music to buy subscriptions oh, to just this kind of thing. That would be grand. this is the kind of thing That's a very that helps idea. explicate music to a, a, a general um, 
audience, we can have longer conversation about that. Well, then. I just don't know. The other thing I just want to say is that when we started this, the description was for a podcast and or a live presentation. Um, I don't know yet in what form that would, would be. I, I've been talking with some of my colleagues about certain approaches. Um, maybe s some of the things we did here today might be part of that. Uh, but um, I, I really do feel a burden uh, for this for this to get out. I think when you, when you if, if, you're, if, if your idea of what rap music is is something you hear doing a Doppler shift as it goes past you standing on the corner if blaring from somebody's car, and then you hear someone like Unjust or Pep Love talk about like their, their intent when they make, like these are the, the, the dictionary definition of serious artists. And the, the thing is, they are not unique at all. Like, it, it, I've been, this year, I've been writing about hip hop professionally for 30 years. And I've done nothing but run into people like this, who when you sit down and talk to them and they see that you're serious, tell you their secrets. And you're always just blown away by the way artists think and their intent and their focus on what they do. Keep on. <laughs> That's very generous, thank you. And that's what Pep Love said too. Keep on, Harry. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Wayne. The, uh, the I agree with Ingrid. The video is really great. Um, obviously, video is not usually a podcast thing. So, can you say right. more about the uh, how you might investigate sort of visual dimensions of telling these stories as well? Yeah, it's it's still <clears throat> it's something that uh, I know we we've, we've talked about some things, and um, you were generous enough to even offer um, an opportunity to to do some things today. Um, it's something I really just have not figured out. I, I have to say in its rawest state that I think of the way a hip hop track is put together as blocks of sound, um, and often sound that's repeated in various ways. Um, one of the other, uh, the other record that we are working on for, the, for our uh, second demo is the record um, Crazy Eights, which you've heard um, by, by Jay Zone, which is just an awesomely intricate kind of arrangement of simple sounds put in amazing combinations. And so um, when you hear work like that, you're kind of inspired as to, are there ways we could represent these combinations visually so that people can see what is actually happening and, and, uh, and get that sense? The, the lyric video was an attempt to get you to kind of see the, the fluidity of Pep Love's vocalization, his, his way of rhyming, which is so distinct and, and odd in, in many ways, um, and just so full of genius. And, uh, and I, so I'm, I'm wondering, are there other ways to display the music itself, um, maybe with a lot of the software and hardware linkages that exist now, so that we can better see, um, see the music, you might say. Right, yeah, it seems like, I mean, we saw Questlove uh, mixing his way through something. Yes. But especially productions more recently that are done with software, you could theoretically look at the multi-track. Absolutely. Yeah. Like I, I had the Pro Tools slide up there, and and um, and and as you well know, many producers uh, make their productions um, and then put videos of their Pro Tools sessions, and you watch the, the you know the the uh, cursors and the cursor just go by as it's uh, lighting up various sound elements. So that's certainly a way. I think there are probably other, other more interesting ways, um, but it's something that uh, I'm, I'm so glad to hear the first two questioners um, ask about this because it's something that has kind of been in the back as we've just been kind of working through the process of putting together the podcast. Thanks. Thank you. Hello, hello, hi. Um, actually, ooh, excuse me. I wanted to go back. Um, uh, like everyone has been saying, the video was great, but I do. I wanted to go back to a slightly earlier part of your career because I've always been really struck by how, um, like, flawlessly and naturally, your place was integrated into what you might call like the whole public enemy um, system of music. And I wanted um, to gain some insight there because. Uh, as her um, summary pointed out, it's kind of been a series of transitions in your career that have all just been so natural. But back at that moment, how did you see yourself fitting into kind of, yeah, like the public uh, enemy, um, like environment or ecology, like where you like, well, I'm a journalist and they're the artists, so 
I want to help them, or were you more like, well, we're all kind of working towards the same thing here? Because it kind of strikes me that like, if someone like Philip Larkin uh, for jazz had hopped on a jazz record back then, or maybe even someone like, you know, the great rock critic Robert Crisco, Chris Gow, not sure if I'm saying that right, um, if he had hopped on like a Beatles or a uh, Rolling Stones album, it would have almost stuck out like a sore thumb, but because it was rap, and like you've been saying this whole time, that it's a system of reference. I, yeah, just I was wondering if you might not mind expanding on how you saw yourself fitting in when these artists like Dilated Peoples um, or The Roots on your few opening interludes call you and they're like, can we use some of your um, magic on this record? <laughs> well, I don't know if they've ever said magic. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's a great question, and thank you for it, Martin. Um, so I would say, uh, first of all, it, it, it was a matter of us all being in the same place. I met Chuck D at Adelphi University when we were both going to college there. And we found out um, that we had a love for hip hop culture, which at that time, uh, in recorded form, was about three years old. Like there was no such thing as a rap record, there was no such thing as a five year old rap record at the time. So um, uh, this was a, a music that, to a great degree, was looked down on. Um, I can very clearly remember people talking about hip hop uh, and saying that it was a fad and that it was going to go away, um, like the Macarena. Um, and so I, I think the best way I can put it is that when I met um, Chuck D, Hank Shockley, um, Bill Stephanie, and the others, that these were the first people who I, these are the first people I, I'd ever met whose intensity and interest in hip hop culture matched my own. So when we got together, it wasn't like, oh, this record's hot or this record's out on the street. Or, you know, it was really about the science of the culture, about why the culture works or doesn't. And these were the kind of conversations that we were having until very late, you know, early in the morning um, until we'd all leave and then go to White Castles and snap on each other. <laughs> so um, it was first just association. We were just all in the same place. Um, Bill, Hank, and Chuck were the first people to encourage me to write about hip hop. I, my interest at the time was being a photographer, um, uh, but I did a paper in 1983 for a college called The Lyrics of Recorded Rap, where I talked about how hip hop lyrics embodied many of the same notions and ideas that one found in other forms of traditional African American music, um, and even African music, including things like Praise for Friends, for example. Um, these were kind of like forward ideas at the time when people were saying that rap music wasn't even music, as many still do. Um, what I remember most was that my, my um, professor gave me such a high grade that it pushed me up to a B and I hadn't been doing any work in the class. So that was, that's, that was a great experience. I think though when, when PE went to, um, went to record, when they went from being Spectrum City mobile DJs to being public enemy, um, working as a writer, the first piece I ever wrote um, and got paid for it's a piece about public enemy of all things of all um, and I, I don't even think I put a, a, a clause in front of anything I was that inexperienced um, um, I, I think Chuck realized as we all did that I could play well Chuck first realized I could play a role you know calling myself a hip-hop activist and media assassin was something I was already doing uh, but he realized that that could that could fit somehow into what public enemy was doing if only because we all saw media not as neutral, but as an oppressive force. Not in the way Donald Trump talks about it. Um, and I'm, I'm amazed that Donald Trump has gotten a second reference in my talk. This is. <laughs> <laughs> but, but oppressive in the way like, for example, I used to, whenever people used to write about rap, right around when I started, it was usually white rock guys who would take a column and, and write about two hip hop albums in one space. I consider that a form of violence. You know, in other words that, like you don't consider this significant enough or real enough to like, even give an artist their due. They gotta be paired up with somebody else in order to fit. And so I was talking about things like that and I think as a writer, I didn't see myself as part of the boys club. I saw myself as someone in their, you know, there's, there's, this, there's this saying, I think it was from the book Tough Jews, um, where one person, where one guy says to his son, um, you, should never, you should never be afraid to end the party too soon. Like, so I was the guy who wanted to end the party too soon. I didn't want to go in there and be friendly. I, wanted, I didn't want to play nice. And I think that attitude also worked with what Public Enemy 
wanted to do, but I think it was just Chuck's genius to say, why don't we have a band with a writer who's associated with, with us? Harry, thank you very much. I really enjoyed your talk. Oh, thank you. Um, and as a complete outsider to hip hop, um, I found the interview uh, with Pep Love very revealing, very surprising. Um, and it was great to hear how the musical pieces were put together. And uh, you know, when you played the song at the end, which I've never heard before. But one thing that I thought you was part of your project that I didn't see here was the analysis of the content, because it seemed as though what Peplov talked about, I didn't see very much reflected in the lyrics. Now the lyrics went by so fast, and you know, I'm an outsider, so a lot of it just went over my head. But it would be really interesting if you're interested in talking to uh, outsiders to also do an analysis of the lyrics. Like, how does this relate? to the wonderful interview he gave. Yeah, you have um, really hit an issue right on the head uh, that's, that's part of this. Um, it, is, it is, if you saw my notes right, on the, um, right underneath the talk, there's a part where I talk about this as a problem, and uh, as an obstacle, and, and what I mean is, is this. Um, I had it uh, on my other computer, but, um, about 20 years ago, I did a piece for Vibe magazine called Harry Allen's Hypertext. And this was the first time I, I, I had used this. And what we did was we took a record by a notorious B.I.G. and we kind of made links to all the various parts of the word, of, the, of, his, of his lyrics, and had like, kind of like bubble text so that you could kind of like read something and then analyze it. Now, this is the common form of any of you who, who go to... Um, Genius.com, formerly RapGenius.com. You know, this is kind of like the structure of what they do. Um, they didn't exist 20 years ago, but um, this, this the, the article did. So, so um, we were when, when I when I wrote the original text um, for this, we ended up using 25% of it. Um, so that's 75% that was just left off because it just would not fit on an issue of Vibe magazine opened up like that. The point I'm making is that um, the, these, these, these lyrics can be and often, often, often can be so dense and so interconnected with other ideas that I haven't quite yet figured out how to do this and how to represent this in podcast form. Again, the article was a visual thing that might have even worked as a poster. I've thought about maybe doing some kind of visual representation that's like on a website. Or, or something else that I can, some other way to grapple with this density. Um, I mean, it's it's really awesome. Sometimes, the 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 level the level of metaphor uh, at which hip hop artists can work um, when they say even really simple things. Um, and so, how to represent that in all these relations, all these semantic relations. Um, is something that I'm still trying to figure out. Uh, I decided to present it as a, as a fact today, but I, how to notate it in orally for the ear is a question that I'm still grappling with. Um, and I really honestly don't know what the solution is yet. So I appreciate you making that point. And it shows your powers of observation, even as a person outside of hip hop. I got a question here. <laughs> Sure, I think, I oh, think. Yeah, yeah, I could, no problem. Okay, I think, I think yeah, you had the, the mic next. Because it, woo. <laughs> I'm not a technology person. You want to take it from the top, especially the part about my eyes. No. Uh, <laughs> um, it, it so beautifully encapsulates, I think, what you're saying about the types of violences done and the alienation from technology. And I guess what 
what this opened up for me in, in seeing the, the draft form of what you're doing and thinking about the Hip Hop Archive's own Classic Crates project is the ways in which you see these as ultimately becoming samples in their own right, right? Down the lines, this archiving project that seems to be taking place of artists, of references, of, of technologies that are changing so rapidly that they will be replaced. Like, where do you see what you're producing becoming a part of the sampling, becoming hypertext and hypotext wow. in and of itself? Well, thank you for that, very, that great question, those very kind remarks. Um, I, I will say this. I will say I've always approached the process of interviewing artists very carefully and with um, a certain attention for detail. I've always tried to work with really good equipment. I've always tried to um, work, if I'm doing it in a live situation, in a noise-free environment. Um, anyone I've interviewed on the phone knows that inevitably I start by saying where we are, what the date is, and what the time is, et cetera. Uh, things of that nature, time stamps at the beginning so that someone listening can know when this happened and where it happened. So I have always, always worked, I've, I've kept all, with, with almost no exceptions, with very few, things I've written, articles I've written and printed and you know, stuff like that. So I've, I've always worked with a sense of, an archival sense about my work, about, and uh, for a long time until it just became, until I found out like, you know, like Madge and Palmolive, I was soaking in it. Um, I used to collect like almost all, you know, that, 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 goes, that goes past a lot of people. <laughs> oh, I collected a lot of hip hop ephemera, um, lots of it, until it just became, it just didn't even make any sense. It, you could, it, it, became, it didn't even make any sense to quite try and differentiate like what was hip hop ephemera. So, so it really just depends on what kinds of systems we, as those who have care for the culture, build what kind of foresight we have about what our culture can be and what it should do. I, I, I really wanted to play Pep Love talking about the purpose of hip hop because it's so interesting that this is an obvious issue and question that you just really don't hear a lot about. Um, much like, I mean, even my draw to do this project, everything in hip hop, big global multi-billion dollar you know, commercial art form, Every aspect of it begins with the recording. Without the recordings, there's nothing to talk about and no reason to focus on anybody. And so I wanted to look at the recording and say, what are these things, you know, and make sense of them. And so that, that I, 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 it's, it's such a great unknown because how do you, you know, visions of the future are inevitably wrong. Whenever you look at YouTubes about, this is what 1980 will look like. You know, no one ever foresees, you know, I don't know, uh, big TVs or phones, cell phones. They, all the visions of the future forgot, didn't see cell phones coming. And cell phones are what changed everything. So it's kind of hard to even make sense of like, what should we be doing now? But working on this project, I definitely did think that it's important for us to record our, art, our, our artists. We should do, be doing a lot more oral history record our artists, do so carefully, use good standards of recording uh, of technology, um, things that are stable uh, with archival intent. Get as much of it as possible. Have artists talk to each other and document that. Um, these uh, these uh, objectives and goals uh, will serve us well, even if we don't necessarily see what's around the corner or where the culture is going next, if I've answered your question at all. Can I, can I, yeah. Um, my question is about sampling. Yes. And so sampling used to be kind of like the great equalizer in that like anyone with a good, can just go dig in the crates and find whatever sound they needed mm. to put in a rap record. So like Public Enemy or Prince Paul, you couldn't make those records now because of legal reasons. Right. And so now rap has become, if you're rich enough, you can get that like one sample and just keep it going the whole song basically. Right. So my question is, I guess about sampling and how that affects your project and what you think about 
how sampling, the use of sampling in making records has, has changed. So to your, first, to your, to your uh, first question, I'm not quite sure yet how it's going to affect our project because I, I, I imagine um, any licenses or uh, for podcasting purposes or live performance pur purposes are pretty standardized around this right now. Um, well, well, one thing I, I was curious, like maybe a DJ wouldn't want to give you his tapes because whoever owns the Doctor Who sample might come after him now, whatever. You know, it's interesting. Um, there, there is, there is, there was one uh, producer um, who made a record that I'm, I've been nuts about for for decades at this point, and had the conversation. He immediately got it, but he did not want to talk about one particular sound on it, either because he didn't want someone to come after him, or he just didn't want people to know what it was. Um, it, it, and, and that might not even be like a thing of like, oh, you're going to sue me, but just a thing like producer's pride. Like, nope, you're not going to. And, and this is something that even at this early stage, as we reach out to other artists, we're already running into a little bit. And not as much sampling um, issues, but producers not necessarily wanting their tricks or their, their stuff to be known, which is uh, the secret sauce. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and hopefully we'll find good ways to get past that logic. I will say this, though. I am very interested. Um, I am very interested recently in the in the in the history of uh, in the history of, of sampling as a racial phenomenon, and 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 by that I mean, I'm interested in the question of to what degree did, to what degree was, were early negative responses to sampling racialized, and to what degree. Were, were they contextualized in terms of contagion? Like, was it a nasty thing to have De La Soul sample the turtles? Was that like, ill? I don't want those rap guys with my pristine composition. Um, like you said, the records, the records by De La Soul um, can't even be released digitally now because of clearance problems. Uh, Public Enemy's early records kind of went into a creative and technological evolutionary dead end. They couldn't be made today because of the, the legal superstructure that's grown up around them. But I was, who was I talking to the other day talking about, uh, I think it was uh, Sadiq was talking about bands like Girl Talk and I think Avalanches who just make work based on sampling. These are white bands and like no one comes after them. I'm talking about samples, like hundreds of samples and people just look at like, like, <laughs> like those guys are just so cool. Look at this, look how innovative they are with this history that starts now and wipes away everything that came before it. And so that issue, the degree to which, I'm not sure of this, the degree to which we can say that hip hop is a music form whose creative, whose evolving creative progress was attenuated by lawyers. And to the degree that this was the first time that that ever happened. I don't, I don't know if there are any other musics in the history of music where a legal system presented the natural apparent evolution of the music. But to the, to the degree that that is what happened and to the degree that it was racial, I'm very, very interested in that. And I hope you are too. First, first of all, I am, you know, really um, just overwhelmed with just excitement and ideas um, based on the talk and the discussion. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Morgan. That, that means so much coming from you. You know, um, and, and this is going to have to be the last question, but can you just say a little bit about your experience? Because one, um, as a fellow, um, and um, I actually meant to ask uh, you this John, even, even though you're just starting, because you're you're the fellow that's been here the, the whole year. So yes. coming into this as a NAS fellow with the um, sense of whatever you're working on is what you're doing and and figuring out the institution. Uh, any surprises or any particular perspective that, that you would share with anyone who who might be doing something similar and, and coming into this context? Because I know it's not obvious that, you know, even resources at Harvard aren't obvious. Um, 
and um, just what the process and any sense of what we should know and what um, other um, applicants to the uh, program might want to know. So um, I'm, I'm not a person who like big on errors, you know, or in, in trying to impress or being impressed. Um, everybody knows I sit in that chair where Christian is right now, the blue chair, every <laughs> single, uh, uh, every single um, colloquium. And a couple of weeks ago, I got up, just finished with the stuff, and I just looked over here, and I saw this, that fourth panel right there. It says, Ralph Waldo Emerson, 1821. So the first overwhelming fact when you get here as a fellow is the greatness of Harvard University. Like, Ralph Waldo Emerson went here and graduated in 1821. It's just there in a little rectangle in a room. It needs to get dusted a bit. Ralph Waldo Emerson. And there are a whole bunch of things like that in this room and all over the place. I remember walking around saying, I've never been in a place before where pretty much anywhere you look, you can guess that that person got into Harvard. So that, the greatness of this university and what it presents in terms of its legacy. I, I was thinking about the fact that when Harvard was founded, the signing of the Declaration of Independence was 140 years in the future. Like, in 20 years, it'll be celebrating its 400th anniversary, you know, and I'm gonna be there. I'm gonna bug Skip for tickets. So, that and the resources here, I, I mentioned the Widener, you know, um, but then also uh, your vision, your vision of saying that this culture needs to be attenuated and it given attention, not attenuated, but given attention that's thoughtful and that's serious. And um, we're gonna have a physical place for it. And because of the, the safeness of the environment, we're gonna, this place is gonna continue, that you and Dr. Gates have done that and were able to do that. That's something that also kind of overwhelms you. I think the thing that surprises you is how fast the time goes. Like, I have three months left. This is mostly done. Um, I think, that everyone is so nice, um, my fellows are nice, people in general are nice, you walk around, it's a comfortable environment, you can do what you need to do. I didn't know what to expect when I got here. I didn't know if there'd be just like cubicles, if I'd have a computer, I, I didn't know any of that. And I have a, the biggest room on the second floor. <laughs> and people let you do your work. And um, I think if, if there's one thing I would like to see more of, I would like to see some really aggressive integration with this larger world of hip hop culture on all levels. I think speaking for myself, uh, I think that's something that I would like to be a part of and that I would like to see. And, and I, I, I don't know, there, there are things in, in, in my head about what that might look like. Um, but um, I, I think that I just think it's just an amazing thing. I'll, I'll, I'll say this. Like I said, I've been writing about hip hop for 30 years, and never has anyone said to me, Harry, what do you think hip hop needs? What would you like to see in the hip hop world, in the world that affects hip hop? Tell us, and we'll give you a year to work on it. No one's ever said that to me before, and I have lots of ideas. So for that, I mean, I'm just forever grateful uh, to the Nas Fellowship, to you, to Dr. Gates, and to all of you. Thank you.